Danger Zones. You started out in, uh, you were at New Mexico, weren't you, State? And you were playing baseball? Yes. How did your career go from baseball player, or college student, to getting into DJing? I got the baseball scholarship to play over there, and I started DJing out there my uh, second year. Mm -hmm. um, just, just doing little things, nothing serious. And, um, but then it became serious over the course of the summer in between my second and third year at New Mexico State. Mm -hmm. And uh, around that time, I was going to go try out for independent um, league for baseball. Wow. And so uh, DJing was starting to pick up. I was doing stuff. I was doing gigs while I was at home and, you know, during break. And then I came back to New Mexico State doing gigs. I had, um, I was doing a bar once a week. And, um, and this so was, then, was this just for like side money, extra money you were trying to make? Yeah, uh, you going to it, it really it really paid my bills because I had a fifty percent scholarship, and the other I had to take care of my own. You know, they tell you you got to go get a job or you got to do something else. <laughs> yeah, and, like, um, did you have any real serious interest in it at that time when you got into DJing? You know, it was really just just take it day by day type of thing, and that's how DJing has always been. You know, the last six years just. I was just taking it day by day, and it kept growing. And I realized, hey, I can make some money. I'm going to go invest in some in some music that's friendly and, and house party friendly. Yeah. So and that's what I did. I came back with, I, I went home with one crate of, of records, uh -huh. and then I came back with four crates. So this um, this is old school. You were you were mixing records. Yeah, this was. I was on records for about two years before I went digital. I was doing that, and then after I did, I did the tryouts in the independent league, and I got cut. You know, naturally, I told myself and you know my family, you know, I'm gonna come back and try out again. I feel like I got screwed over and yada yada. So, sure. um, but then I, I never did go back to tryout because I hit that fork in the road. When you're DJing, you you're just not walking into a club and saying, "Here I am tonight, let me mix." It's, you still have to do a lot of pre work, don't you? Um, well, you got to know your crowd. You got to know what you're getting yourself into, what area you're getting into, um, what songs are hot in that area. But at, at the end of the day, it's just about filling out the crowd because you can say, oh, they're like this, and then they are not like that as soon as you get in there. You know, it's all, it all happens in the moment, and that's what you kind of have to prep for um, as a DJ. You, or, I mean, you, you just, you just got to be ready for anything. DJing, you can easily coast it and just play the hottest tracks with no, you know, just, just throwing it at them. You know, you can do that, and you'll, you'll probably have a decent night. But there's, there's, there's an, I think there's an artistic way of delivering a proper set, and, and, it's, not the, and it's not one particular set. Mm. You know, it's, it's your, your, the possibilities are endless, and it, it depends on what you can create for the crowd. And I think that's what different, differentiates DJs, because like I said, you can coast it, put your gears in neutral, and you mm -hmm. can sound like every other DJ that's out there. Uh -huh. Or you can do something creative, read the crowd, and hit it with something they're not expecting, uh -huh. use certain yeah. tracks they're not used to hearing, and, and still keep it funky enough for them to groove to. And they remember that, and, and the owners remember that, because the owners and the, and the managers, they hear the same songs every day. So when you do something different, they, they make note of that. They see that it's working. And that's why you have residency in what? Las Vegas and Los Angeles too, right? Yeah, at, um, at Lavo, Marquis, and wow. Um, the Palms. Wow. And, and in L.A. Um, I haven't done anything in L.A. in a while. Let me ask you, there were a lot of bottle rats out in the L.A. when you were playing clubs <laughs> out there? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. You know, you really don't notice them when you're playing because you're focused on your set. But when you're out with friends and, you know, friends have tables and you uh -huh. see the same girls bouncing from table to table. <laughs> and, you know, chances are they all their bottle popping. Coincidentally, all their bottle popping friends that night are their friends. And, you know, they, you're the one that's got the leader of the new school style of DJing. Why, why is that? Yeah, it's um, it's it's there's a lot to it, you know, from from the music itself to um, carrying yourself as an individual and as a businessman. You know, the the new school DJs were frowned upon because at the time when a lot of the when a lot of the the laptop DJs, so to speak, were popping up. Oh, I've um, seen a lot, a lot of them. Of the, the, yeah, you know, there's a lot of them, and and it's easier because. You just buy a laptop and you're a DJ as opposed to creating, you know, buying records and creating, you know, an arsenal of music to play right. with three or four crates of music, you know? Mm, yeah. Um, so, so those DJs, the, the laptop DJs didn't go through the trials and tribulations of carrying four crates of records in the rain, in the snow, uphill, mm. downhill, 
to the club, getting their crates stolen. Like they didn't go through all that, and a lot of the older DJs didn't didn't appreciate that these guys just started out on laptops. Right. A lot of the old, you know, if, you, if you look at the tweets of some of the older guys, you you know, or the complaints, they would say something like, you know, you gotta earn, you gotta earn the digital, you gotta earn the laptop. So with, with all that being said about um, the new school guys and how they evolved and how the older guys didn't appreciate them. Um, you know, and, and also there's some of the new school guys, because there's so many of them, they, they, they feel they have to undercut to get jobs in. Oh. You know, they have bad, they, they, they've ex, uh, expressed bad business etiquette. Yeah. So with, with all that being said, um, my what, what I've um, created for my life, uh, for my business, is, is just to handle um, things with integrity, and and, and I've I've proven that I don't you don't need to undercut or do anything that's going to piss anybody off, and that's right. and you know just to be successful, I, I can be I've I've shown that I I am successful just by doing the right thing. Um, I think when you undercut, when you cheat yourself, when you cheat others, it yeah. shows a lack of creativity on your end. Yes, um, it's all about and so. It's all about and, uh, trying to get the dollar. That's all it is. It's no more art, yeah. artwork, and it's all about the dollar. And and the, you know, and you know what happens is the guys who are undercutting make it tough for the guys who are at your level, obviously, and and below that. Because I'm not. I gotta admit, you're at kind of a different level than a lot of people. But they're all working towards what you where you're at, and it just hurts those guys because they have to leave the, what they love. And you know who really suffers is the fans because when they're coming to the club if they got a bad dj who's just cutting prices and the club owner only is concerned about his bottom line his bottom line falls out because each night there's less and less people going to that club you're you're really hot i mean you're really known out there now and this thing you're playing with a lm well laughing my it's <laughs> off right so you're playing with that or, or, or uh, love my friends and every and and what is it love my friends and others that's what it is <laughs> okay that you know that's a lot a lot nicer and politically I usually... correct way of saying it is that. <laughs> okay. and that's got to be awful cool you're on the international touring with these guys now right with red foo and sky blue yeah. Oh wow! That, how long have you been touring with them? Is this just starting now for you? you just start... Oh no! It's, it's I've been with them for about four months now. So you guys really mesh really well. Yeah, we only did the states with Sky Blue, um, and then he hurt his back, so we haven't. Sky Blue hasn't been around. He, the, oh. the second or third last show of the of the American tour, he re-injured his back, so we oh. haven't seen him in a couple months. He's got a chronic back problem. Oh man! You know, and yeah, it's, you, you it's know, going for a while. You know who Red Foo's father is, don't you? Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, very gorgeous. And, you know, just another piece of music out there, world. He's getting together uh, the old pianos that he had in the studio. He's getting together with Paul McCartney, and they're throwing a, a benefit in New York. It's 10000 a ticket if you're interested in going. Only 100 yeah. people. Only 100 people are going, so that's a million dollars. But it's a great thing because they're restoring history. You're with some people with some long track history in the music world. You learn a lot from these guys too, or, or do you learn from each oh, other? Oh yeah. Okay. When 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 I'm when I'm with um, Fu and um, you know anybody else that's been in the business for a while, I really just I, I just keep my mouth shut and I just listen to what they have to say and there you and go. I'll just try and soak up as much as I can. So you know, Sky has something to say. You know, I've, I've hung out with him a number of times. You know, I listen to what he has to say. And it's just anybody else in the business. I mean, the managers, the, um, you know, just the, the stage directors, the mm. security guards. Like, I, you know, these guys all have history, and they yeah. they, they have some stories. And, you know, it's You're getting a great college education here in the music world, touring with these guys without paying for it. You're making money out of the deal. How, how sweet could that be? You're, you're coming to Chicago. What's this all about? You're, you're going to get on a flight today from L.A. and fly into Chicago and... What are you doing tonight here in Chicago? Yeah, I have a DJ set at um, Studio Paris, oh. and um, and so yeah, it's just me though. There's there's no um, party rock takeover or anything like that. So uh, okay. I mean, I'm excited because I've, I've done this club with the the crew before, yeah. and it was it was sexy, it was fun, the crowd was ready to go, oh. and it was it was all the above. So I'm looking forward to. What is a website or something that your fans can follow you? You have a website, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's djdangerzone.com. Okay, and how about a Twitter? Uh, DJ Danger Zone, and my fan page is just Danger Zone. 
Well, I'm sure I'm going to become a fan. I'm going to like you. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, I appreciated the time today. You know, let me know, and I know you got to get uh, ready to fly into Chicago. And I hope a lot more people are going to pour in if there's still tickets available to get in. It's going to be so fun, and yeah, I, I can't, I can't say any more about it. Oh yeah, you'll be one tired guy when you're going crawling back to LA the next day, huh? <laughs> Probably, but it'll all be worth it. Well, thank you. You have a great day, and and welcome to Chicago in a few hours. Yes, thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Danger zone. Bye bye.